Hey everyone, it's been over two minutes. Haven't been raped yet. But I just keep plodding along. Stop playing. Break free from your chains. To break free from your cage. What we don't want to do is go back to a traditionalist world. Hi, I'm Diana Davison. I've been talking about a book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, and this is going to be the final discussion from it. I've taken two parts out of the book that I think uh, pertain to MGTOW, or men going their own way, and um, how they're doing something different that's important. So I'll explain a little bit about the first quote from it, because um, in the story, uh, the author's alter ego, Phaedrus, is a teacher at a university. And there's a reference in there uh, to the church. And this, uh, you'd ha I'd have to read way too much from the book to explain it um, in the quote. So I'm just going to tell you up front, the church is not actually a religious thing. It's a description of how um, reason and um, logic and education are within the building of a university, but the building itself is um, just the structure that houses it, and the Church of Reason is the, um, the act of pursuit of knowledge. So uh, part of his uh, journey, and some of the things that he got into trouble over, at one point he decides that um, the universities um, shouldn't worry about being accredited and they shouldn't even bother grading students, and um, he goes into his explanation of what he thinks would happen. Now, this is um, interesting on the level of being a discussion about universities because of the state of education, and the social justice warriors, and postmodernism basically destroying universities and what education is nowadays. And that could be a whole other video on its own. But if you think about the um, educational system and the university being like society in general, uh, which he gets into at the end, he makes that comparison. Um, it's a really interesting uh, way of looking at it, in part because he uh, mentally pursues uh, a path of what would happen if. And that's kind of what MGTOW, I think, um, are trying to do as well. One of the criticisms of MGTOW is, but what about society? You know, it's all going to fall apart. And MGTOW generally just go, yeah, and what's your point? Um, but they are being asked on a regular basis, what do you think the world should look like? And um, if it becomes solution-oriented at some point, then this type of mental journey, this type of imagining what would happen, um, will become an interesting discussion to have. So here's Robert Persig. This was written in 1974. This is his vision of the educational institution and what happens if people basically go their own way. Um, and also looking at, uh, he, he creates an analogy, which I'm going to go back to, about men being mules pulling a cart. And, uh, hopefully have a lot of fun with this analogy at the end. Phaedrus's argument for the abolition of the degree and grading system produced a nonplussed or negative reaction in all but a few students at first, since it seemed on first judgment to destroy the whole university system. One student laid it wide open when she said with complete candor, of course you can't eliminate the degree and grading system, after all, that's what we're here for. She spoke the complete truth. The idea that the majority of students attend a university for an education, independent of the degree and grades, is a little hypocrisy everyone is happier not to expose. Occasionally, some students do arrive for an education, but rote and the mechanical nature of the institution soon converts them to a less idealistic attitude. So this, uh, the point of interest here is uh, not just with education, but with life. Why are you here, and why are you doing this? The demonstrator was an argument that elimination of grades and degrees would destroy this hypocrisy. Rather than deal with generalities, it dealt with the specific career of an imaginary student who more or less typified what was found in the classroom, a student completely conditioned to work for a grade rather than for the knowledge the grade was supposed to represent. Such a student, the demonstrator hypothesized, would go to his first class, get his first assignment, and probably do it out of habit. He might go to a second and third as well, but eventually the novelty of the course would wear off, and because his academic life was not his only life, the pressure of other obligations or desires would create circumstances where he just would not be able to get an assignment in. 
Since there was no degree or grading system, he would incur no penalty for those. Subsequent lectures, which presumed he'd completed the assignment, might be a little more difficult to understand, however, and this difficulty, in turn, might weaken his interest to a point where the next assignment, which he would find quite hard, would also be dropped. Again, no penalty. In time, his weaker and weaker understanding of what the lectures were about would make it more and more difficult for him to pay attention in class. Eventually, he would see that he wasn't learning much, and facing the continual pressure of outside obligations, he would stop studying, feel guilty about this, and stop attending class. Again, no penalty would be attached. But what had happened? The student with no hard feelings on anybody's part would have flunked himself out. Good. This is what should have happened. Now, I see this as an accurate description of what happens in people's work lives as well. You start a job, you're enthusiastic, and then just as time goes by, you start to lose your enthusiasm for it. And then you're just going there because you need the money to pay the bills or to be the provider or, you know, for whatever other reasons you're doing it. But you're not doing it because you um, take any sort of pleasure in the work or get any sort of um, reward out of your main part of your life, you know, the nine to five, the, uh, you know, sometimes 12 hour days that you're putting in, you're not doing it for the right reasons anymore, if you ever were in the first place. He wasn't there for a real education in the first place and had no real business there at all. A large amount of money and effort has been saved and there would be no stigma of failure and ruin to haunt him the rest of his life. No bridges had been burned. The student's biggest problem was a slave mentality, which had been built into him by years of carrot and whip grading. A mule mentality which said, if you don't whip me, I won't work. He didn't get whipped. He didn't work. And the cart of civilization, which he supposedly was being trained to pull, was just going to have to creak along a little slower without him. This is a tragedy, however, only if you presume that the cart of civilization, the system, is pulled by mules. This is a common vocational location point of view, but it's not the church attitude. The church attitude is that civilization, or the system, or society, or whatever you want to call it, is best served not by mules, but by free men. The purpose of abolishing grades and degrees is not to punish mules, or to get rid of them, but to provide an environment in which that mule can turn into a free man. The hypothetical student, still a mule, would drift around for a while. He would get another kind of education, quite as valuable as the one he'd abandoned, in what used to be called the School of Hard Knocks. Instead of wasting money and time as a high-status mule, he would now have to get a job as a low-status mule, maybe as a mechanic. Actually, his real status would go up. He would be making a contribution for a change. Maybe that's what he would do for the rest of his life. Maybe he'd found his level but don't count on it. In time, six months, five years, perhaps, a change could easily begin to take place. Who'd become less and less satisfied with a kind of dumb day-to-day -day shop work, his creative intelligence, stifled by too much theory and too many grades in college, would now become reawakened by the boredom of the shop. Thousands of hours of frustrating mechanical problems would have made him more interested in machine design. He would like to design machinery himself, He'd think he could do a better job. He would try modifying a few engines, meet with success, look for more success, but feel blocked because he didn't have the theoretical information. He would discover that when before he felt stupid because of his lack of interest in theoretical information, he'd now find a brand of theoretical information which he'd have a lot of respect for, namely mechanical engineering. So he would come back to our degreeless and gradeless school, but with a difference. He'd no longer be a grade-motivated person, he'd be a knowledge-motivated person. He would need no external pushing to learn. His push would come from inside. He'd be a free man. Now I find it interesting to consider the supposed value that society places on freedom. And we've designed our whole democratic political structure to support individual freedom. And yet, when you really look at it, uh, society is telling you that they want a mule. They have no interest in your personal freedom. They've given you the tools, uh, which are actually being taken away a little bit at a time, 
um, starting with freedom of speech and so on. But um, they espouse this ideal of uh, freedom of the individual within society, and yet everything about the way our society is constructed and the pressures within it put upon men really just says, shut up, you're a mule. All right, now I note in there he talks about not being a mule. He talks about being a free man who's doing what you want to do, and that's what the next quote is going to um, discuss, what you want to do and doing what you like. Uh, but he also talks about when you go into the hard knock school of life that um, you become a useful mule. So I just want to point out that that is a little bit of a glitch in, in the storytelling here, that uh, the idea is to not be a mule at all. And uh, I think that the interesting point of that um, part of the book is the discussion of why you're doing what you're doing and looking at why you're doing those things and really soul searching as to where you got these ideas about what you like. And that's what this next quote is about. Why should quality be just what you like? Why should what you like be just? What did just mean in this case? When separated out like this for independent examination, it became apparent that just in this case really didn't mean a damn thing. It was a purely pejorative term whose logical contribution to the sentence was nil. Now, with that word removed, the sentence became, quality is what you like. And its meaning was entirely changed. It had become an innocuous truism. He wondered why that statement had angered him so much in the first place. It had seemed so natural. Why had it taken so long to see that what it really said was, what you like is bad, or at least inconsequential? What was behind this smug presumption that what pleased you was bad, or at least unimportant in comparison to other things? It seemed the quintessence of the squareness he was fighting. Little children were trained not to do just what they liked, but, but what, of course, what others liked, and which others, parents, teachers, supervisors, policemen, judges, officials, kings, dictators all authorities. When you are trained to despise just what you like, then of course you become a much more obedient servant of others, a good slave. When you learn not to do just what you like, then the system loves you. But suppose you do just what you like. Does that mean you're going to go out and shoot heroin, rob banks, and rape old ladies? The person who is counseling you not to do just as you like is making some remarkable presumptions as to what is likable. He seems unaware that people may not rob banks because they have considered the consequences and decided they don't like to. He doesn't see that banks exist in the first place because they're just what people like, namely providers of loans. Phaedrus began to wonder how all this condemnation of what you like ever seemed such a natural objection in the first place. Soon he saw there was much more to this than he had been aware of. When people said, don't do just what you like, they didn't just mean obey authority. They also meant something else. All right, now, one of the things that men going their own way encounter a lot in the comments section and uh, elsewhere in, in external criticisms is uh, accusations of selfishness, of uh, abandoning the cart the, in the mule and cart scenario. And what about the children? And what about society? It's all going to crumble. You know, the, the human race will cease to exist if you stop breeding. All of this, um, these demands that are being put on men to stop thinking about what it is they want, and what it is that makes them happy, and uh, demanding that they put on the, the harness again and get back to pulling that cart. So in this analogy, and I want to have fun with this myself a little bit, but uh, basically I want to encourage everybody else to think about all the different roles in this uh, mule and cart scenario. What you have is, um, you know, man is the mule, he's pulling the cart, and the cart is, you know, society. And women are basically inside the cart uh, with their children. And it, it actually increases, you know, the weight of the cart, it makes it harder for it to pull, and the women are in this cart going, why are we going so slow? So most women are actually still in the cart. Some of them have gotten out and they said, oh, I'll help you pull the cart, but they basically aren't pulling their weight very much. 
And then they brag about how they're so cool because they're pulling the cart with you. But every once in a while they want to get back in the cart and they want to take a break and sit down and they don't want you to stop pulling it. So we've got men as the mules pulling this cart and they don't have the option of getting in the cart and letting the chick pull them and uh, there's nobody else there to pull them themselves. So, you know, visually I picture a, a long road down a, you know, a desert kind of path and there's this guy all on his own pulling a cart with some chick sitting in it popping out BBs, right? And uh, that cart, one of the questions you can ask is, why are you pulling the cart in the first place? Well, I think there actually is um, a good reason to be in motion because that's, you know, part of the thing that makes being alive interesting is that you create a goal or um, come up with something you'd like to accomplish, which is the journey. Um, but then, you know, men are innovators. And so you may start out with a cart, but, you know, we've got airplanes and such now. So you can create a different kind of vehicle and try to accomplish your goals. One of those goals is trying to come up with new, better forms of carts. And it's not that um, you don't want to be moving forward. It's not that you don't want to be actually doing something. But the reality is that you start doing this thing and then all of a sudden a bunch of people pile into your cart and they want a free ride. <laughs> so um, I see men going their own way as people who have unhitched from the cart because that cart got overloaded with people who were freeloading and they're walking away. And some guys are just walking away going, fuck the cart. And other people are saying, you know what? I'm going to come up with a something better than a cart. And, you know, <laughs> you've got uh, a bigger analogy of the mule and cart where you've got multiple men pulling a bigger cart that is your society, um, your country that you live in, your government telling you that you must pull this cart because this cart is of importance to you. Um, it's the thing that makes you a free mule while you're <laughs> harnessed to the cart. And, uh, and they're whipping you forward. And you believe in that cart for whatever reason. That's the thing that I am really impressed with with MGTOW is that they're not just saying, you know, I'm a mule. Why am I pulling this cart? Fuck this shit. They're actually going, how did I get attached to the harness pulling the cart? And uh, so anyways, I think there's a lot of interesting um, analysis that you could do with that analogy, trying to figure out, you know, what is the cart? Where did it come from? Is it my cart? Is it society's cart? Who's in my cart? How many people am I pulling? Why am I doing it? And, you know, do I want a cart? Do I want to go down that path in the first place? I think ultimately, if you don't go down that path, if you're not moving forward in some way, then why are you alive anyways? So there is a journey to be taken, but it's up to you to decide what journey you want to take. If you want to take anybody with you on that journey, and if you do, they better be pulling their weight. They better be doing something other than just whipping you and uh, sitting in your cart asking you why you're not going faster. So have fun with the analogy and uh, hopefully that inspires some other people to think about that as well. Now to finish off, I'm actually not going to do a rape joke at the end of this. I had some questions because of recent comments I've made regarding whether or not it's useful to fight feminism and uh, explaining why I think it's not. It's futile to fight feminism. So the title of my, the, the name of my channel being Feminism LOL, somebody suggested I change the name of my channel. So I'm going to give you a couple of options. Um, my, my stance against feminism and why it's futile to fight it, I don't really think um, is problematic for the name of my, my channel because I'm really just laughing at them. And by using that name, I have feminists showing up thinking this might be a feminist channel. And I have anti-feminists showing up who are then asked to look a little bit deeper into the issue. So I actually kind of like having that. So my alternate options are, one, feminism, and two, feminism, meh. Let me know which one you think, or maybe I'll just stick with the original.